Well, um, I was delighted to be invited to come and uh, to give a talk about engaged anthropology. And the, um, this is a particularly auspicious time um, for all of us right now, and uh, particularly for Brown University and the Hafenreffer, which um, is in right now a very changing, a changing kind of engagement with, uh, with local New England Native American communities. And so I think it's a good time to talk about uh, community collaborative uh, research and the relationship between archaeology and, um, and indigenous peoples. Um, so the uh, Maya cultural heritage, this is the, um, the book that brought me here tonight, and this is the cover of it here, um, subtitled How Archaeologists and Indigenous Communities Engage the Past. Um, so heritage, what is heritage? It's certainly different from archaeology. It's different from history. I'm, I'm going to use George Nicholas's definition of heritage, which was just recently published. And he's contrasting heritage and archaeology. Archaeology is how we learn what happened in the past, while heritage is that set of values given to or possessed by objects, places, and information that might be derived from archaeology or from other means. We are most familiar with the scientific and historic meanings ascribed to these, but less so with local values and specific needs of descendant communities. And so, um, you begin to get some insight into the tensions that exist between um, heritage, which is actually really quite local, and then more global kinds of interests. And we're used to hearing about heritage as a global thing, right? World heritage, global heritage, the World Heritage Organization designating fantastic sites all over the world um, as sites worthy of conservation. Um, and in fact, even with the World Heritage Site inscription, there's a significant tension between the desire to conserve these incredible places uh, for future generations to see and to learn from and to experience, um, and the needs of local communities. And so you see over the years, if you look at the UNESCO legislation and the, and the rules and protocols, that there's increasing attention to balancing this notion of, of global or world heritage with local needs um, and local community. Um, and likewise, there's a tension between archaeologists and indigenous communities who value the past um, in very different ways and for very different reasons. Um, and so to do engaged anthropology um, in, in the Maya region, or, or really anywhere then, is to, oh, let me go back here, is to really um, engage with that difference, to work with that difference. So archaeologists, indigenous communities engage the past in different ways, and um, how, can we, how can we bridge that, and how can we build a, a collaborations that benefit both parties? Um, so the um, so this is what I want to talk about tonight, um, and of course, as an archaeologist, I have to start with the map. Um, and uh, so this is uh, what we um, archaeologists call the Maya region, and you can see it's the area shaded with the with the uh, green shading around its borders. It's it's an incredibly large area, topographically quite diverse, um, and it's also linguistically um, quite diverse. Um, and culturally quite diverse. Um, and so there really is no such thing as the Maya of today or of yesterday. It's, it's, it's a very, very diverse kind of area. So I want to talk a little bit about the different ways in which Maya peoples of today um, relate to their past. Um, and then I um, want to share with you a program um, that we've just completed called Maya from the Margins. Um, it's, uh, we had this incredible State Department grant. Um, at, so I want to talk a little bit about that. And then, I, and then finally, I want to uh, take you up here to Takavo, uh, where my current archaeological project is going on, a, a collaborative uh, project. Oh, with the community and with a Yucatec archaeologist by the name of Ivan Batuna Puche. So the um, 
thinking about just today, and this is just, we're, take, we're, we're really taking broad strokes here, and thinking about the different ways across this Maya area that people, uh, Maya people uh, relate to the past, to these, particularly these massive structures that were built by their ancestors. Um, the upper left-hand corner is Chichen Itza, and you can just see the base of El Castillo, or the Temple of Quetzalcoatl. And in the foreground, you see a Yucatec man who is carrying um, the goods that he is um, going to prepare to set up to sell at Chichen Itza. And ever since the state of Yucatan uh, purchased the site of uh, the, the, the surface rights of the site of Chichen Itza, which Ina, the Instituto, never owned, um, the uh, site has been flooded with more and more and more vendors every year, so that it's really actually quite difficult to visit the site now um, because there are so many vendors there. And it has led people like Quetzil Castaneda to suggest that Chichen Itza has become a Nohotki week, which is a huge marketplace. Um, but this is the way in which um, many of the uh, local people from Piste uh, relate to that site, and they argue that their ancestors built the site, so they should be allowed to come into the site um, to sell their wares. And so the, the benefit that they can't, could derive from being, from being uh, descendants of the people who built Chichen Itza. Um, moving to the southern um, part of Guatemala, the site of Ishimche in the center there, um, the Kakchikel population have a very different kind of relationship to the site that was the last Kakchikel capital um, of the, in the 16th century before Europeans came onto the scene. Um, and that site is very much associated with, it's, it's a very, seen as a very powerful place that that is also a place where um, amazing kinds of healing can take place. And so the, uh, the site, there's several fire of these big fireplaces that uh, throughout the site, and um, with every time that I've visited the site, I've seen some kind of healing ceremony going on. And so they're relating to the site in a very different way. In um, down here in southern Belize at the site of Lubantun, you see um, a ceremony going on there, um, a um, Mopan ceremony. And in southern Belize, and, and Kekchi people are involved in this too, sitting in the background there. And these uh, ceremonies have to do with making um, their presence known at these ancestors, at these very, very old sites, which arguably probably were not built by their direct, uh, their, their direct ancestors, but they um, nevertheless are in a kind of pitch battle with the nation state of Belize to recognize their land rights and to um, and to allow them to own land collectively in southern Belize. And this is one vehicle for expressing that through um, archaeological sites and, and uh, being, being present and being in dialogue with these places. And then finally, uh, Tikal, um, the, which is a World Heritage Site. And Tikal is a place in which um, there has been a huge movement of people uh, through this uh, area, like uh, diasporic migrations into and out of this area of the Peten, really since the ninth century. So a very dynamic area with people moving in and out all, um, all the time through the end of the classic period and the post-classic and then the colonial period. Um, and so, but nonetheless, um, there are very, very frequently um, Maya people at the big fire hearth at the, in the Grand, Great Plaza at the base of Temple One, and they are making offerings and praying, and they are present, and they are to be seen um, and to be associated with this World Heritage Site. So the, this idea of being present, being in dialogue with these powerful places, um, and you know, and wanting a seat at the table in terms of decisions about management of these places, these are all issues that you know kind of come up over and over again. Although the local circumstances and motivations, uh, you know, are are very different from place to place, and. 
even this very uh, simple thing like being present at a place um, is, it may sound very simple to you, but it's really the result of a, probably a century of struggle to, to get to this point. Um, and still in the four nation states of the Maya region, um, in the formal educational system, there's very little to no education that deals with Maya, um, Maya history, Maya hieroglyphs. Um, and uh, so the students who come through the education system don't really learn anything about what archaeologists have been finding in the last 100 years of tremendous archaeological and very productive archaeological research um, in the Maya area. And initially, when we started to work um, and think about well, what sorts of collaborative projects might be um, good to put together, we were really um, wanting to work um, with the grade school children and offer workshops that would provide some of this uh, some insights and, and some of the uh, some of the tremendous things that archaeologists had learned. We, we were struck by talking to these uh, Chorty kids living around Copan and they would ask like, what do those people do when they go in those tunnels? I mean, they knew that archaeologists were working like mad that these white people would come from North America, go into those tunnels. They had no idea what happened after that. And, uh, and so we felt that, that this, it, it, you know, the inequities of that uh, situation were pretty, pretty extreme. And so we um, started, we had a chance to start some workshops up in Belize and Honduras and Mexico um, in the grade schools. And we did that. And they were really a lot of fun. And, and, and they were arguably really quite effective. This is one of the winning posters that you see on the left here from a, um, uh, a heritage conservation contest that we held uh, in the Toledo district of southern Belize. And then on the right, you see a young boy, um, Chorty boy, who is uh, creating his version of the, uh, the, you know, the pyramids and temples of Copan um, in a workshop. Um, and the, and even a, uh, in Honduras, we did also a mapping and surface collection of a recently um, abandoned Chorti dwelling, Casa Los Sapos is the name the students gave to it. And it was really very interesting to look at and watch how these students became so wrapped up in this old abandoned, you know, like the house had been abandoned 10 years previously. It was, it was really very young in terms of archaeological terms. But the, the mapping of it, the surface collection of it, the curating of the objects, and they began to become um, uh, these, you know, these curators and, and to develop this very close relationship with the place and the objects. And so this very, what I call a very diagonal curatorial impulse that um, we as archaeologists all have because you know we're trained in this way and you can really see that developing and see how that led to this desire for um, for conservation of this place they would always ask well, what's going to happen to this place what's going to happen to this place and the so uh, the, this, the, the, the power of the, the field experience in and of itself to really change the way people think about places uh, became uh, very clear to me as a result of that. Um, but, but we also were um, really, we, we, we imagined a world in which children would go to school and they'd learn hieroglyphs. And we knew that there was one teacher in Yucatan who was actually doing this. And so we um, created an educational video um, to be played in Yucatan. And it's called On the Road of the Ancestors. And you're looking at the, the title of it here. Um, and the these are Mexican marionettes or puppets, and they speak Yucatec, um, and they go to school, and they learn the word. They learn hieroglyphs. They learn the, to recognize them. And so the whole thing was shot on location. They also go to Chichen Itza, and there, there's a lot of 
uh, there's about six different episodes of it, but I just want to show you the episode where they are um, heading off to school and then and then they're learning hieroglyphs and so you know it begins with a, a milpa episode and they're worried that you know, there's, there's storm clouds but no rain coming. I'll just go forward a little bit more here till they get on. Then they get on their these little pedicabs that you see all over Yucatan. And, uh, and they bicycle off to school. That's her mom. So, <laughs> the genius puppy. He's doing all the work. His sister is just riding. And, and that's how you already see it. The man is doing all the pedaling, and the woman is just sitting, uh, getting a ride. And then this is an actual school in Yucatan that. Malukin Proven. So, Kuchu, Weyanone. Cotton is Najoy, so Kuchu. Malu, in a kind cast is a choker. In cutting cast is a suit seat catch, which me my yo. This is what Malu bless Shokunari law to the Ushmayao, he shock me like young. The rabbit is supposed to be comic relief, but it didn't really quite work, but it was, uh, it was a good idea. Exactly, Shumper, Ustumben, Pexilibal. Can it? Ustin Tane had to Mimbalgo, Chimbale, Matich, and Oxa Holdic. Let me just go forward a little bit more. Here, here we go. Okay. That Seban Natalogo, like a big to grab for so. Pumpel Patpenile, who yali Pumpel Bal. So he starts with the easy ones, the animal. Holy Hibs. Bala. Balam. Jaguar. Chom. Chom. What is that? Vulture, I think. Egg. Dog. But that's a gopher. Kai. Fish. Yetel sauce. The leaf nose bat. Yamwashta kalamilo. And uh, and then of course if you're gonna do the glyphs you also have to do the numbers. So let me go forward a little bit more. There we go. Bell jump hook. El ula solo so so ka. Umpel. Kapel. Ospel, Kampel, Hopel, Wakpel, 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 Bolompel, Yetel la Humpel, Uyes me in parallel, Te Uspen Soka, U Pastas Pirkes, Sol Sok Chmaya, Lete Puyala Numeros Tio. Pe yo, Tenet in Willik Numero Nueve. Campbell Punto, Yetel Hupel Raya. You can hear they're, they're speaking in Yucatec, but there's quite a bit of Spanish. Yetel Campbell Punto, Yetel Cabel Raya. Then, Hatchbayan Le Utre Maya Wo. Beyo, to la Zone. So the, um, the, the version, the original version has, um, you can read subtitles that are in Spanish or are in um, English. And um, so the, and when it was shown in schools, um, an unanticipated uh, problem occurred because some of the students, um, if they weren't showing them with the Spanish subtitles and some of the students didn't, you know, couldn't um, understand Yucatec, they, they were really turned off by the video. And so um, all the, the sort of the complications of doing things in indigenous languages and how that can enfranchise some and distance others, you know, we, we realized that um, was something that uh, we hadn't really been dealing with um, and that we needed to deal with. So these were incredibly fun projects, um, but they were kind of difficult to sustain in that they needed a constant infusion of cash and, um, and lots of energy to, to keep them moving. Um, we knew that we were reaching, you know, between Southern Belize and Guatemala and, and Yucatan, we were reaching thousands of kids. Um, but we didn't really know what the long-term impact was going to be of these projects. Um, and uh, then we had an opportunity to um, do a project that would, um, working with high school and college kids, 
um, and directly exposing them to um, archival research. Mm -hmm. And so that seemed like a project that might have um, some real potential in terms of uh, really changing career paths in, in, a, in a very direct way that we would then be able to um, to follow and track. Um, so this is um, uh, called Maya from the Margins, Archives and Experiences of History, Identity, and Migration. And two archives were involved with the project, um, an archive at the University of North Carolina in the Wilson Library, the Southern, it's called the Southern Historical Collection, and uh, Brian Gamza is the director. Um, we linked that archive up with an archive in Yucatan, at um, the, the archive of the state of Yucatan, Archivo General del Estado de Yucatan, located in Merida on the western side of the state. And um, Ivan Batun Alpuche was the former director of AHE. Um, and then for this project, uh, Dr. Gabrielle Vale was my um, program director. And so she did a lot of the legwork in back and forth and connecting people uh, together. And as I mentioned, this was a US State Department grant through a program called uh, Museums Connect. Well, we weren't really connecting museums. We were connecting archives. And that was fine with them. And they were, they were very excited about that. And so the idea was to build cultural bridges um, through archival research between these high school students of Maya descent living in Morganton, North Carolina, and Yucatec College students at Universidad de Oriente Uno in Valladolid. Lead um, Yucatan. And so you probably are thinking at this point in time, how very random is this? Mm -hmm. Why is she dealing with descend a descendant Maya population from Morgantown? Well, it's because of the work of Leon Fink, who um, is a labor historian. And he was at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for a while. And he became very intrigued by uh, this group of immigrants in, uh, from the highlands of Guatemala, primarily from Aguacatan, um, who came, um, traveled from Guatemala to uh, North Carolina in the 1980s. So as you all know, it's a very tumultuous time um, in Yucatan um, to work in this poultry processing plant, case poultry processing, and then began to toy with the idea of unionizing. And um, I don't know if any of you know anything about North Carolina, but unionizing in North Carolina is a very formidable kind of challenge. Um, and those people now had children who were high school and college age. Um, and so they're, they're the next generation. And we all know that within the US right now, I think one of the least represented populations at uh, colleges and universities um, are what are called Hispanic or Latino populations. Um, and that for some reason, my populations, I mean, indigenous peoples are grouped in with that a, a huge category. Um, UNO, on the other hand, is a, uh, a really a college, they call it a university, established in Valladolid. It's a state university established so that um, students, local students living in the Valladolid area could get a college education without having to travel to Merida, which is kind of the flagship you know, university of the state of Yucatan. But um, as because UNO is fairly new, um, it, you know, it's not really terribly well funded. And so the opportunities for students at that college to do primary research is, is not the greatest, except for the fact that they're sort of living uh, amidst all this amazing cultural expression and practices that students will get involved with recording. Um, but nonetheless, a trip to Merida from Valladolid, it's, it's a big deal, and it's expensive, and it's not something that um, many of the students would do lightly. So we brought the students, the students from Morganton, into the, uh, to Chapel Hill um, from, um, to the, like, two and a half, three hour drive. It's kind of, North Carolina is a very skinny state on an east-west axis, um, and to study materials in the George Stewart collection, which was given to 
uh, the Wilson Library about a decade ago now, and it contains just amazing information, a lot of 19th century information about the caste war, the, um, the sort of insurgency um, uh, of, of the 19th century in which largely uh, Yucatec people were fighting against the um, the forces of a sort of a recently federalized Mexico, um, and the um, but there are also a lot of early photographs by archaeological photo photographers who were photographing archaeological sites in Yucatan and Guatemala for the first time. Uh, Kil Martin's material is there, and so the students and all sorts of economic records and 19th century newspapers, whole runs of them. I mean, it's just an amazing repository of information that George had collected and very generously gave to the Wilson Library before he died. Um, so we brought the students in several times. You can see Adonis here uh, learning about a Yucatec economic history through a study of ledgers uh, in, in the Stewart collection. And since uh, the students were in Chapel Hill, and since I have a collection of Maya artifacts on loan from the government of Belize from the site of Kashob, uh, we brought them into my lab and spent some time looking looking at artifacts and talking about uh, talking about this really old stuff that they were really excited to be able to hold in their hands. So, um, so when the students in North Carolina were undergoing um, this experience of of archives, um, the students in Yucatan were doing a similar thing. They're traveling from Valladolid to uh, Merida to work at, in the in the state archive there, and um, they were able to look at what I later learned were some amazing and uncatalogued documents. And for those of you who work you know, with archives, you know um, how difficult that is to get to see things that have not really been properly cataloged because the archive cannot then keep track of you know, where things are and who's looking at what. Um, but they <clears throat> were looking at Yucatec language documents um, and, and translating them. Um, into Spanish. They looked at, for instance, a, I, I remember one, a 1790 petition written by a scribe in a Maya community asking that the community be temporarily relieved of a sort of this chronic church construction obligation that they had. And they weren't able to get to their fields, to plant, to weed, to do anything, because uh, they were just constantly being asked to build these churches. And and, um, and there's another really great letter that, I don't know how it ended up in the State Archive, but it's written in 1852, and it's like a secret like a, a letter written to the leaders of the Crusoe, of, the, of this insurgency, this mid-19th century insurgency of Maya people. Um, uh, about um, informing them on the whereabouts of the soldiers and telling them, okay, you can come and attack Bacala now because they're not here, you know, they're not here or they're, it's not guarded. And so it's really some, some really quite amazing documents that they were able to see and translate into Spanish. And so the students at both ends put together an exhibit and then the students from Yucatan brought that exhibit um, up to North Carolina. And what you're looking at here are the panels um, from the exhibit. This is an installation that we did. And, you know, it's a very portable installation we did in Morganton, North Carolina, in the um, public library there. We also um, had a showing in Chapel Hill at the Wilson Library and, and also in Asheville. And here are the copies of those Yucatec document, Yucatec language documents with the Spanish translations, and and we had English translations also, and um, so the exhibit would be set up, and then people from the community could come. So um, all there, and then there's a panel on this side of the room that is specifically about the caste war. So both the North Carolina students and the students in Yucatan were, you know, of course, the caste war is a kind of an exciting thing. And so any information that relates to it is, is quite extraordinary to look at. 
so after the um, after the touring about and for the students from Yucatan, uh, for them they thought that this was all really wonderful. But then um, Gabby took them out to the Cherokee Reservation in Western North Carolina, and, they, and for most of them they said that was absolutely their favorite thing about visiting um, the states it was to go to the Cherokee Reservation and see and see that. So then everyone, then the the Yucatec delegation and. The U.S. delegation. Uh, we all went down to uh, Yucatan together and, and traveled around for a week in this big blue bus um, and visited places like Tihosuko, which uh, it w is a location of the Castuar uh, Museum, and um, and mounted the exhibits. Had an exhibit showing and at the State Archive in Merida in, in Yucatan, and you can see the students all together here doing a selfie uh, with a selfie stick. Um, and here is. Uh, uh, Gabriel Vale and, and Brian Giemza um, were just outside of the of the archive here. Um, and then um, we all traveled to Takabo, the place where I have a current project going on. And the students there had choreographed this incredible dance um, that they did in, in our honor. And you know, and then the food came out. And for any of you who have ever had the experience or pleasure of eating Yucatec food. It's just, it's, it's just really fabulous. And so um, that was, students were really very impressed by that. So what, what did this mean? What did it mean for the Yucatec students to be involved with this? What did it mean for the students from uh, uh, Patton High School in, uh, in Morganton, North Carolina to be involved in this? Well, it's a really, it, the program just ended, so it's really kind of early to tell. But, but I think it's quite interesting how a couple of these uh, student reflections that we, we could think about now. Um, one of the UNO students, Dianelli Estrella Valencia, yeah. Um, she talks about the written expression as, as part of her cultural identity, an antecedent of the evolution of the Maya people. Archives are and will be an identifiable memory of our roots. And, and so she's um, echoing words um, that have been published by Mayan intellectual Victor Montejo um, about the importance of of, of the written word in as part of Maya heritage. Um, and so, it, you know, for her it was a very natural thing to reconnect, to connect with, not reconnect, but just connect with these archives in Merida and to see these letters and, um, <clears throat> and petitions written in Yucatec Mayan and to begin to um, translate them and try to make them more, more widely available. So, for her, that was really a, kind of a very natural feeling part of her heritage. Um, one of the Morganton uh, High School students, Mateo Gonzalez, who really has only lived in the States for, I think, about 10 years now. Um, you know, he loved, through archival research, I was exposed to a unique and exciting and intriguing way of exploring 19th and early 20th century explorers' materials. Meeting the Yucatec students helped me develop a sense of pride and confidence about myself as Latin with a Mayan identity. Um, and <clears throat> so you can see for him, the experience was really uh, and hitting on two registers. There was the exposure to primary research, the archives, and everything that was there that he just had no idea existed um, prior to his coming to the Wilson Library to see this material. And then also that sense of go, moving from where you feel very much like you're a minority um, in, in a larger culture, going to Yucatan, where Yucatec people are the majority, and then you know, having a very different sense of himself when, when he returned then to the U.S. Um, and feeling sort of more com much more comfortable about his identity. All the students said they wanted to, they were going to travel back down to Yucatan as soon as possible. We'll, we'll see how soon that happens. Um, so the early prognosis is that, um, that this has been a pretty effective project, um, but, you know, 
time will tell, and we want to try to um, follow the students um, in, in a more longitudinal fashion and find out what they're doing five and ten years from now. We do know one of the students from uh, Morganton uh, is enrolled as a freshman at Chapel Hill this semester, so that makes us very, very happy. Okay, the, um, in, in thinking about, though, that project wasn't really that archaeological. So if, if we think about how do these uh, projects on the ground doing archaeology look within a community or next to a community, um, how do those, how, how does engaged anthropology work in, in those contexts? So I want to speak um, more directly to that for, um, for the remaining time that I have. And so we'll go now to um, Takabo, which is located here kind of in the northeastern, eastern part of the state of Yucatan. It's the Gulf of Mexico up here. The, the uh, little city of Valladolid here, Chichen Itza, um, over here. And Takabo is not a very large place. Today, only about 300 people live there. Uh, in the past, it was probably three to four times larger. Never a huge place, but for some reason, it just pops up all the time through historical records, um, early encomienda there, um, and then the establishment um, of a visita there in, uh, in 1612. And uh, that's uh, uh, recorded by Lopez de Cogolludo, a sort of religious historian um, who wrote about Yucatan. Um, and here um, you see the remains um, of that visita. And uh, it was dedicated to San Bartolome. So these were um, churches where a priest would not be resident, but he would visit. And then he would be on a, a circuit of places that he would be visiting. And uh, Takabo was one of them. And so there would be a uh, con congregación or reduction of the population around the around Takabo to build this structure. But Takabo is not a colonial town. It is a town that has very, very deep pre-Hispanic roots, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so we know that a visita then was established here in 1612. Um, and uh, it still is the, the small chapel there now that uh, is still, of course, dedicated to San Bartolome. And here he is um, getting ready to be carried on a litter um, around the, through the streets of Takabo um, on his patron feast day in August um, in, um, of the year 2015. Um, so tremendous. This is 400 years later, and you know, doesn't skip a beat in terms of the, the patron saint of this town um, remains the same, of course. Looking at um, a map, an archaeological map, a bird's eye view of the central portion, we see the remains of the 17th century church here that in plan view looks really very much like a three-room, late classic Maya structure. Um, and, uh, but of course it had, if I go back, you see the, you know, it has a, a, a Roman arch and things like that and a tablet up here. So um, it's really a, built in a very different style. But in plan view, it, it, it bears a remarkable resemblance. And then here's the front facade of the new church, which um, uh, was the probably the facade of the, of the older church as well. This is a very old front wall here. The side walls are much newer. Um, and so this part of the church here where the congregation would sit would have just been covered with a huge palapa, um, just pole and uh, thatch roof. Um, and only the sanctuaries were made of stone and sometimes um, the front face of the church as well. But then you notice all of these concentric topographic uh, lines, contour lines over here. And of course, this means that uh, this indicates the presence of a mound, a big Maya mound. And this was um, a big pre-Hispanic shrine that is has been reduced in size, I, I imagine, probably by at least half, if not more, um, because all the stones from that shrine would have been taken, removed, to build the stone um, church, the visita. 
Um, and this shrine would no doubt had a, uh, a patron deity um, that was you know, the focus of the shrine. And so you can see what is very intriguing about this is the way in which this, um, the Spanish friars uh, co-opted this place, this very sacred place, um, and then remade it, um, I kind of remade the place um, into this. It's a sort of a very good exercise. Uh, you can see it quite graphically uh, in ecclesiastical placemaking um, in building the church right next to this mound. The, um, so the, so the, the, the deeper history then of this town and part of the reason why um, we decided to conduct a project here is because of, of this very deep history of it and the way in which the colonial period is just right next to uh, the pre-colonial um, material. Um, and that, that, that tension in itself is really, is really quite, um, quite interesting and important to study. And we don't really know enough about it um, in this corner of the world. The, um, so in, then in, in starting to work at Takabo and talking um, with the community about, well, what did they want and to see? And people really felt very much like they didn't know anything about their town. And they wanted to have a place where they could go, where their kids could go, where visitors could go to learn about the place. And Takabo, as I mentioned, it never really it was a very big place, but it just keeps cropping up in um, archival sources. It was one of the first um, ejidos to be formed in Yucatan, and, and so on and so forth. And so it's just this kind of remarkable little place that just keeps ticking away. And then, of course, the very deep pre-colonial history of the place. Um, so we, um, we were able to get some uh, support from the Archaeological Institute of America to build, uh, well not build, but to create a museum. And we didn't have to build the building because the town donated a room in their town hall. Um, and here you see us at the ribbon cutting ceremony. There's Yvonne Batun, my co-director um, of this project and the um, sort of the mayor from the nearby Kolot Mool, um, and the people of the community um, who attended the, the ribbon opening ceremony. And the, so we tried to um, take everything that we knew about the town from mostly um, colonial times and later, and um, try to show that information graphically. And the museum has been really pretty successful. And the town is really um, quite excited about it. And this is the um, two-year anniversary, the, the Ballet Folklorico performing on the two-year anniversary of the opening of the museum. And the, you know, these museums, these little community museums have been uh, just catching on like wildfire all over Mexico, in, especially in places like Oaxaca also. And they're an interesting combination of like artifacts that farmers have found in the field and they bring into the museum, and then um, old coins, and then you know uh, all sorts of uh, a, a kind of different things that are brought together that are really evocative of that landscape. Um, and so, this museum, I, I actually was kind of lukewarm about the idea of a community museum um, in a little town in Connecticut where Peter and I spend a lot of time. We have a community museum and hardly anyone ever goes to it. And so I thought, oh, I don't know if this will really be um, successful or not. But it, um, it really has been successful. Um, and this is the first night of the opening of the museum and uh, the people going around and looking at the exhibit. So at this point in time, there weren't a lot of objects in the museum, and a few more um, have kind of shown up, and we've made cases for them as, t as time went on. All of the a label copy is in Yucatec and in Spanish. And so the, uh, for the school children, you know, Takabo is like most Yucatec communities, very concerned about whether or not they're going to lose their language. And so even though many community members probably don't read Yucatec, um, having it there, it means it's something that you can study and you can look at and you can think about. And this was um, having 
UNO, students from UNO who were really studying Yucatec Mayan um, at a college level, you know, allowed us to really, they, they were the ones who really put these, trans, have put these translations together for us. And so that, that also made, makes it a resource that the community has uh, that they can draw upon as seriously as they choose to. Um, and there's a lot of school children who come in after school to, to uh, look at the museum and they write little papers and stuff like that based on the museum. Well, okay, so, so the museum wasn't quite enough then. There was a heritage trail that, um, that was designed, and this is largely through the efforts of one of my graduate students, Maya Diedrich, um, and you can see the men are putting up one of the heritage trail signs. This is right by the, uh, by the church, explaining the history of the church. And the heritage trails then were trilingual. They were in, um, in Yucatec and in Spanish. Um, and of course, you know, the townspeople insisted they also be in English because they wanted to have English-speaking visitors <laughs> come to their town. Um, and so the uh, Heritage Trail has about six or eight stops along it. But you get a nice view of the town. The town is a beautiful cenote and tons of these uh, dry solution sinkholes called rejolladas that are, um, are really agricultural uh, treasures to the to these little towns because they have very deep soils um, and so and then just before I came up here I got this uh, this kind of fairly poorly focused photo in in my inbox that now finally they got the sign up for the uh, for for the turn off to Takabo. So advertising the fact that they have caves and they have uh, a church, an old church, and they have a museum, um, and so they are they are on the map now. And I think that this has also been very interesting for me because. You know, in anthropology, there's a lot of very critical discourse about heritage tourism, and, and rightly so, really, because many times uh, those who benefit are not those who should be benefiting from it. Um, and um, but we, uh, but but what we're seeing here is something else. Yes, of course, um, townspeople hope that more people will come and visit, and they will come to their little tiendas, and they will buy cokes and 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 buy empanadas and stuff like that. Um, but they also have this desire to uh, just to be seen and to be recognized for the community that they are with the heritage um, that they have. And this is really without our even really digesting the, the recent excavations we've just started doing um, in and around the community. And I think one way to understand this is I'm going to reference something that, that Bob is uh, familiar with because it, it happened uh, when, when he was still at Penn, and that is a, a conference on indigenous perspectives on cultural heritage. Um, in the Americas and Hawaii, that um, the Inherit, uh, formerly Machi, and the Penn Cultural Heritage Center put together, and this, this is the group of us here, and um, after a couple of days of just of talking about what heritage means to um, these people who were not bureaucrats or more indigenous leaders in, in their home places. Um, and this four-point um, conference consensus came out of it. And I know that's a lot of text on there. But I, I just really want to draw your attention to the very first one. Um, and these, uh, this idea that tourism can be predatory, it can trivialize cultural practices, it can divide <coughs> communities destroy ecologies, but if fed and controlled by local communities, can lead to greater recognition, respect, and understanding. And so um, I think that's what you know we're seeing also, although there were no people from Takabo at that conference, um, because it was you know, before that project even started, I think we're seeing the same kinds of uh, ideas coming to the fore about wanting, wanting the recognition, wanting the respect, wanting the understanding, and wanting sort of more of a cultural sharing go going on. Um, so <clears throat> how is community archaeology, um, community collaborative research changing archaeology? Is it changing archaeology? Well, I think 
quite realistically, it does resituate archaeology away from this dyadic relationship between archaeologists and places, archaeologists and objects, to a triadic relationship among communities, researchers, and objects and places of archaeological interest. So it's really um, creating this kind of triangle of, of involved um, objects and people and places. Um, it repositions communities and places as, as co-participants in anthropological investigations. So there is power sharing that goes on uh, with this community collaborative research. And then it open, but I think importantly, um, it opens up new possibilities for research and heritage conservation as researchers consider ontologies outside of the Western mode. And this is not that we haven't considered them, but we um, haven't considered them in the way that, uh, that, that, that indigenous peoples do. And I, I, here, let's go back to this four-point consensus and the very last point here. Ancestral places and social memory represent repositories of indigenous knowledge and experimentation. They provide a wellspring of innovation and resilience. OK, this is a very different way to think about archaeological sites. And the, um, I re, it remind, when I first heard this, and then I, I'm reminded of something Norm Yaffe said about the archaeological approach to archaeological sites. It's like where he said, what are we doing? Are we, write, are we making report cards on the past? You know, you fail, you don't fail. You know, it's a sort of this idea of societies fail or they succeed. Um, and, but maybe this is Luke thinking about experimentation and, and innovation and resilience and when that happens and when it doesn't happen and how long it happens for. Um, these are very, this is a very different approach to understanding and thinking archaeologically and, and one that actually is going to be featured in early December at the Getty at a conference um, out there. So I think that this, um, this, these insights have real staying power and they really are helping to reposition the field of archaeology in a way that is, is very productive and opens up, I would say, it's new epistemologies. It's new way of thinking about how do we know what we know and, 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 and applying that to the past. So I want to stop there, um, but encourage you all to connect with Inherit. We have a free, uh, it's, we try to get it out quarterly when we can, newsletter that you can sign up for just by going to www.inherit.org. And of course, I want to give a call out to all the communities, colleagues, students, donors, and volunteers who make Inherit programs happen. Thank you very much.